Well, essentially, the Bombay Improvement Trust was a civic agency set up by the colonial government, uh, provincial government in Bombay. Um, it was set up in 1898 following uh, a, a major plague epidemic which had broken out uh, two years earlier. Now, the plague had an enormous uh, impact on the colonial uh, official uh, colonial officials in Bombay, uh, largely because it was a fearsome disease. Uh, it had all the associations with the Black Death and so on. And uh, when it broke out, when it was discovered in Bombay, it triggered uh, enormous panic. Um, the sanitary infrastructure had tended to be very limited prior to this. And the plague galvanized it into action. And you can see how it was the panic that, that caused this reaction. Uh, and it was not simply in Bombay. As it spread outwards, its impact was also to be felt in uh, many of the other towns uh, and, and villages, though, of course, the scale of intervention was not uh, uh, the same. But it had an enormous impact on the Indian subcontinent. Uh, it also led to political unrest. Uh, there were a number of plague riots. In, in there, was, uh, there were two in Bombay, a minor riot in 1896 and a major one in 1898, uh, but also in other towns and, and cities where colonial attempts to go and exam forcibly uh, 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 go into the homes of those who were presumed to be living in affected areas triggered enormous uh, resentment, um, led in some instances to attacks on European officials and ordinary Europeans too. The Improvement Trust was the first exercise of its kind in colonial India where the state, the colonial state took up the responsibility of, of uh, undertaking urban development on such a scale including uh, the whole issue of trying to rehouse uh, the poor by by pulling down their uh, insanitary uh, hovels and, and, and the ins insanitary conditions in which they lived, to ameliorate that by building sanitary housing for the poor, and to undertake urban development uh, on a larger scale. Uh, than it had hitherto done. So in that sense, the colonial state, for the colonial state, this was a new, uh, a step in a new direction. Um, and it was triggered largely not because it was somehow keen to do this, but because it was pushed to do this by the conflict, uh, by the crisis rather, that was generated by the plague. Subsequently, that model of, of the Improvement Trust was taken up and deployed in other cities. So Calcutta had its own Improvement Trust in 1911, other cities in North India had Improvement Trust set up. So this model of the Improvement Trust, where a process of sanitary um, overhauling, civic uh, redevelopment would take place through the agency of a specific body known as an Improvement Trust, I think the, that model was set up primarily in the first instance with the formation of the Bombay Improvement Trust in 1898. My account of the Trust and my research is largely based on official sources. And, and there were a lot of these. Uh, the Improvement Trust itself produced an annual report every year from 1898 onwards, listing all the various activities it had undertaken, uh, outlining its um, income streams, its expenditure, giving details of the different sorts of schemes that it had undertaken. Um, and this, these reports are a very valuable source of information in trying to put together in trying to reconstruct the activities of the trust. Um, and these can often be read against the grain to, to find out or, or to tell a story uh, that, that runs counter to the narrative that's there in the, these reports, because these reports uh, have a tone in which, you know, they portray their achievements in, in, in very, uh, I won't say triumphalist, but they certainly they they want to indicate that they they are making progress. They're they're bringing you know they're achieving the things they're meant to achieve. Uh, but one can often find in them details which run counter, which undercut that story of of, of constant achievement and progress. You also then have uh, the local Indian newspapers, which at this time uh, were very vociferously um, uh, involved in articulating. Uh, their resistance to or opposition to specific trust schemes uh, and, and the newspapers became one of the means by which the Indian intelligentsia which felt very excluded by the activities of the trust in, the, in that you know, they felt they had no say in the way in which the city was being run and certainly the way in which the Bombay Improvement Trust functioned. I also used some sources which are very interesting in that 
they have, haven't been used at least in the context of the Bombay Improvement Trust. And these were the uh, Bombay P Presidency Police secret abstracts of intelligence where you had police reports on the activities of the trust and the kind of resistance to them and who was fomenting the resistance because this was clearly the colonial state using its mechanisms of surveillance. In 1898, you have uh, the establishment of the trust and it's very much modelled on preceding um, English and Scottish uh, improvement schemes of the mid to uh, late 19th century. The trust was a statutory body. It was set up by a specific piece of legislation and the composition of the board was stipulated in the act. Um, it was stipulated in the legislation and it had, the interesting thing of course was that it was largely dominated by uh, the uh, representatives of different elements of the colonial uh, state, the colonial establishment. Uh, the Bombay Municipal Corporation had minimal representation on it uh, and uh, on the whole, the Improvement Trust was largely seen by many as another department of government because of its the composition of its uh, board uh, of trustees. So both in terms of urban development and in terms of the city's social geography, the Improvement Trust had a very critical role to play uh, in reshaping Bombay in the years after, uh, you know, the years since 1900. Slums was the term they used to describe these poorer neighbourhoods. The trust d demolished uh, a number of dwellings uh, in areas that were regarded to have been the breeding grounds of the plague. And um, the people who were dispossessed, you know, people who were dishoused rather, uh, were intended originally to be rehoused by its housing schemes uh, and it built quite a number of tenements in Bombay. Not all of those who were displaced by its housing schemes were rehoused however in, in, its, uh, in, in these new uh, tenements that it built uh, and very quickly these became uh, you know these came to be inhabited by people from the lower middle class and, and the middle classes. The trust also had a critical role to play in the development of the suburbs uh, or what came to be known as uh, the suburbs. Um, by developing plots outside the um, city um, or what was then the, uh, the city of Bombay. And this again was to have long-term long -term consequences because many of the uh, suburban areas of Bombay today were first developed by the Improvement Trust. British institutional practices uh, did have an important uh, influence on um, the way in which the colonial state in India responded to the plague. But that's one side of the question. It's equally true that the specificities of local circumstances also dictated the nature of those policies. So it's really a mixture of both these two elements. And I would say that on the one hand, if you look at things like the Improvement Trust, which was set up to combat the plague, obviously, in the first instance, uh, clearly British institutional precedents had a role to play in the way in which um, the colonial state in Bombay responded uh, to the plague. Uh, British ideas and practices also informed specific plague policies in Bombay and and clearly uh, you know ideas about uh, the contagionist aspects of the plague and and uh, you know the fact that the way to deal with it then was compulsory hospitalization forcible confinement of the body these drew from ideas that were not simply specific to India but were more of more general prevalence the Improvement Trust was also important in a second sense. It also became the model against which subsequent attempts to redevelop cities, subsequent attempts at urban planning uh, began to define themselves. Uh, for example, those who came to India in the 1920s, people like Patrick Geddes, uh, who came during the First World War but then stayed on, and who became very interested in questions of urban planning, rejected the, whole improve, the premise of the whole Improvement Trust model and, and wanted something that, uh, a model of urban development that would be somehow more suitable for Indian conditions, was not simply blindly enthralled to Western models, or certainly the British models of urban development, which would, in this view, had shown to be clearly failures. Uh, they wanted to reject this uh, sort of, uh, the, the improvement trust model of urban development, and going for forms of urban development which would be more in keeping with Indian traditions and suited to Indian conditions, and that again had a very important uh, consequences right through from the 30s onwards, indeed to the period after independence. The attempts to redevelop Bombay in the late 19th and early 20th centuries have interesting 
parallels with what's going on or offer interesting parallels with what's going on today. And obviously the interesting question is not simply what, what's similar but also what's different. At the same time, it's clear that the idea of what a modern city should be in terms of you know, ideas of free circulation, the ideas of cities as commercial hubs, the ideas of uh, uh, you know, the attempts to define public spaces uh, and, and ideas about the dangers posed by the poor, the aversion to the uh, settlements of the poor, you know, whether you call them slums or whether you call them by any other term. Uh, the, the idea, the, the fear amongst many urban elites and urban residents that, that the poor pose a threat in some ways or their practices are antithetical to the ideas uh, of modernity that, that these elites uh, have embraced. It's very interesting that there are these parallels and obviously uh, without sort of suggesting that, you know, that, that, these, you know, that these are actually the same developments or, or at different points in time, it's those parallels that I think are worth keeping in mind when one thinks of, of the long-term history of Indian, the modern Indian city. God, how many times am I supposed to tell you about my breakfast? I had snails.